Well, good morning. Happy Easter. Glad you're here today. My name is Joel Reynolds. I'm the teaching pastor here at the gathering. I don't always wear ties, but when I do, they're bow ties. <laughs> I'm glad you're here today. It still seems strange to me to kind of be in this teaching format. i am I'm been with the gathering for just a little over a year now, and really all my experience up until this point has been a youth pastor. And, and there's days that I miss it, okay, because you all are not nearly as interesting as teenagers are. I miss the stories. One time I was working a camp uh, out in California, and I was the, the, the pastor for the camp. So every night we'd have a service, I would preach. Um, and a couple of times during the week, I would allow the students who were at the camp to respond to what Scripture was saying that night, to, to respond to what Jesus perhaps could be doing in their life. And uh, I would have our leadership come down, and they, they worked with the students like, you know, way more than I did. I just showed up once a day and talked. They built these relationships. So I wanted the, the teenagers that that, that needed to respond to Jesus to talk to them. And I would stand on the stage and, and, uh, and try to look serious and pastoral. You know, I'd kind of do one of these poses, like I was thinking about something. But really, I was just looking around to kind of make sure everything was okay. And as it was winding down, I would kind of call us to a close and send the students on to be with their, their groups that they came with, their youth groups. And one day, that was kind of what, where we were, just tracking along. Everybody's having a few conversations here or there. And in my mind, I'm like, we got to start to wrap this up. And then this, this little sixth grade girl, like maybe 12 years old, she starts coming down the aisle to her leader. And I mean, she is weeping sob like inconsolable and so I'm like uh oh this is gonna go on for a while and it did she got with her leader and she's just just weeping and sobbing couldn't couldn't get her under control couldn't even really get her to say anything because she's just uncontrollably crying and I'm like what's going on over here he's like she confessing to a murder is this like an unsolved case that's about to be solved like she had that much guilt upon her and so that leader kind of was aware of what was happening. So she kind of pulls the little girl off to the side, allows me to come forward and kind of send everybody on to the next thing for camp that night. But she stayed over in the corner for a long time, talking, talking, talking to this little girl, finally able to get her to say some things and kind of helping her through whatever she was needing to respond to. And all of our leaders are kind of hanging around like, what's, what's happening over here? So finally... She escorts that little girl back to her group and she comes back in. I was like, if you don't mind me asking, what just happened? She's like, man, I couldn't get that girl to say anything. She just cried and cried and cried. And I'm telling her, if I, wanna, if I can help you, you need to help me help you. You know, talk a little bit here. She said, so I finally got her to kind of go, you know, what's going on? Do you need to respond to Jesus? And the little girl went, yes. And, and, and she said, well, you know, what's going on? Then all of a sudden the girl starts crying again, won't say anything. And finally she's like, you know, is there something like you need to confess? Kind of put out the little girl, yes. She said, okay, we're on to something. What do you need to confess? She's like, I take things. It's like, you take things? Like you steal? Yes. And starts losing it again, crying all over again. She said, like, you take stuff from a store, like, you know, Walmart and Target? She said, no. You, do you take stuff from, like, your family? Yes. Like just sobbing all over again. So you take money from, like, your mom's purse? No. We got to help me, you know? You're responding to what Jesus is doing in your life. Help me help you. Who do you take things from? Finally, the little girl goes, my sister. You steal from me. So you're stealing money from your sister? No. You're stealing CDs? No. What? If we're going to work on this, you got to help me. What do you take from your sister? And she said it took a little while because the girl was crying, just broken, weeping. And finally she said, what do you take from your sister? And the little girl went, Makeup! Man, I miss that. Miss teenagers in that capacity. But the raw honesty that she had. See, something happens. Whether you're 12 years old or 22 years old or 52 years old or 102 years old. When Jesus confronts you, when the reality of who he is is before you, you're going to respond. And really, there's two ways that we're going to respond. 
this little girl responded and that you're going to respond. And the two options are before you, and they are your choice. There is no pressure from us. And we're just simply here to present kind of the direction that we think Jesus wants for your life. But it's still your choice. Because I don't mock this little girl. I'm actually in awe of the brokenness that was within her, the confession, the repentance, the desire to not take her sister's makeup anymore. But when we are confronted with the truth of Jesus and the reality of what he has done and what he had done for that girl and what he has done for you, your two choices are to respond with awareness. That's one way to go about it. She was aware that she had made mistakes, she had committed sin, and she needed to confess it and repent of it. She needed to trust in the hope of Jesus. She needed to trust and be faithful. And she wanted to worship Jesus. And she worshiped him through her confession. That's one way that we can respond. And we can respond to Jesus with awareness. But the other option, the other choice for every single one of us here today is we can respond with avoidance. I hear it. I'm just riding this church thing out today. I'm just riding the service out here. I'm here for my mom or my grandmother or both of them. I'm here to get my meal afterwards. I'm going to listen to the chubby guy in the bow tie and then I'll be done. That's your choice. There's no pressure from me. But since you're here and I look so nice, we're going to talk about that a little bit because you are here. I'm here. We're all here. And before us is the profound truth, the profound reality of what today is. It is Resurrection Day. It is Easter. And that is the defining point in everyone's life. It is the dividing point in history. There is everything before the resurrection and everything after the resurrection. And smack dab in the middle is what Jesus did on this day for every single one of us here. That's the power of Easter. That is the power of the resurrection day. That is the power of Jesus. And now what's before each of us is, how do I respond? Do I respond aware? Aware of what he did for me? What he did for you? Or do I continue to avoid this? Because we here at the gathering, just to put it all out there, we believe that the resurrection changed everything for us, for this world, and for you. That's why we're glad you're here. That's why I dressed up today. So we could zero in on who you are and what Jesus is offering to every single one of us this Easter in fact, what Jesus offers to us every single Sunday, every single day, every single month, year, decade, century to you. So what we're going to do together for the next few minutes is explore one small passage of Scripture written by somebody that we talk about and study often here. His name was Paul. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. After Moses, he is one of the most prolific authors in all of the Bible. And he would write these letters that have fallen into our view of what Scripture is. And he would write these letters to gatherings like ours. To groups just like ours today. People from across the board coming to ask ourselves the question, what do I do in response to Easter, to Jesus, to what he's done for me? We're going to look at his letter to a church called Corinth. He wrote him two letters, and we're going to look at the first one. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll put it on the screen. We've got it in the worship guide. Everybody should have gotten one as they came in. If you have a Bible with you or a tablet or a smartphone, however you want to look at it, look at it with us. And we're going to see how Paul was writing to a group like ours, and he's just saying, hey, you're here, and since you're here, let me tell you this story. Let me tell you of what Jesus did. And he starts to lay it out. Let me look at the first two verses real quick. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Let's look at verses 1 and 2. This is what he says since you're here and they were here and we're all here. It says this. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel 
that I preach to you, which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved. And if you hold fast to the word I preach to you, unless you believe in vain. Paul was writing to this church and they were struggling, just like maybe many of us are, struggling with what Easter is, the resurrection, what Jesus had done in the grave and coming out of the grave. And they were struggling with that. And so he was writing a letter to them ahead of him coming to teach them in person. He had been there before and he had talked about this before and he would talk about it again, but he wanted to send this letter because they were dealing with, just like many of us are dealing with, what does this really mean for me, for my life, for my family? And so Paul's saying to all of us, there and here, you're here. So let me remind you again of the gospel. He says there's a gospel. And that gospel we respond to it in those two ways we just talked about. He says, you've received it and you're saved by it and you stand in it. He's saying you're aware of this message. You're aware of this teaching. You're aware of the gospel. He says, or, in verse two, he says, unless you believed in vain, you're avoiding it. So the same two choices before each of us were the same two choices between, before these readers here. They stand in it, they're aware of it, they're saved by it. They're holding fast to it or they're believing in vain. They're avoiding it. The choice is yours. The choice was theirs. Yet the gospel is what it is. So since we're here, since I'm all dressed up, let's talk about what the gospel is. The gospel is the complete story of what God did through Jesus for every single one of us. The gospel is Jesus was humbly born. That's Christmas, the incarnation. And he was humbly born. God came to earth through his son to make connection with him again. But that wasn't the whole story. There was more to it. See, Jesus obediently lived. He lived without sin. He committed no crime. He was guiltless through his humble life that he put before. And that's not the whole story. There's more to it. See, Jesus humbly sacrificed himself. That happened on Good Friday. He went to the cross. Why? Because I'm sinful. I'm guilty, and so are you. And he went and sacrificed himself for us. But that's not the only part of the story. See, Jesus obediently died. He didn't just go to the cross. He took it to its full end. He died for my sins. He died for your sins. But that's not the complete gospel. There's more to it. We have to know that Jesus triumphantly was resurrected. The story, the gospel that was preached then and now is the totality of what Jesus did. We can't just take one or two of these and go, I'll grab onto that and I've got the gospel. No, that is avoiding the full story, the full truth. These are not interchangeable. Paul's message here and our message week in and week out at the gathering is what Jesus did, how he died, how he rose again, and how he lives now so you can know God and I can know God. Because that was God's plan all along. That's what we've been doing all month long here, working, walking towards this day. We've been looking at the Old Testament and how it foreshadows the cross and the grave and what Jesus did to fulfill God's plan. You can get that series out in the lobby. I'd invite you to, to get a hold of them and listen through them to see how God's plan has been there since the beginning of time to save us. All of this was God's plan so he could bring forth his promise. And his promise is that he'll never forget you. He will always reach out to you. And Jesus' life and death and resurrection were the purpose to bring forth this promise promise to fulfill it. It was his plan all along. So Paul is giving this in a very failed way. I'm trying to give it to and place it before us that this is the gospel. This is what Jesus did. All of his life, all of his death, and all of his resurrection laid before each one of us because the choice is ours to stand in it, to be aware of it, or to believe in vain, to avoid this. 
The dividing line between those two choices is the resurrection. See, up until now, everything that Jesus said and everything he did, that was good. Man, I like that Jesus. And then all of a sudden, Easter comes and changes everything. We're like, wait, 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 wait. He was buried and now he's out? Like, I work in a nursing home. I'm around death often in my day job. And I'm yet to see any of them come back in and be like, hey, here I am. Wait, you died three days ago. Yeah, I'm back. Where's bingo being played? That doesn't happen. That's crazy. I get it. It, it blows me away just like it does you. It's like, wait, hold on. That's what Easter is? Is it a ghost? Is it somebody real? What is it? Is this just made up? Did people just kind of get together and say, let's say he came back so we can write a Bible and sell it. What's going on here? But that is the dividing point in this. Belief in Christmas and belief in Jesus' good teachings and good works and miracles, man, that's, that's important, but that's just only one part of it. We must see that the grave is empty and he's no longer in there because he has power over life and death. That's what's laid before us and the choice is yours. Because the wisdom of the time there, and probably sticks around here for many of us, the prevailing wisdom at this time was life was extinguished at death. There was no such thing as a bodily resurrection that you could have a physical embodiment after you died. That was stuff of fables. And many of you here are probably, yeah, that's that. I get that fable, this whole Jesus fable. But since you're here, we've got to put it before you that this is what Scripture says, this is what we believe, and this is what we preach to you, the gospel. Jesus born, Jesus lived, Jesus died, Jesus resurrected. Why? So God's plan for your life could be fulfilled. It's the only way. Easter changed everything, and it still does and it can today in your life, in your heart. Jesus crucified and buried for our sins. Jesus resurrected from the grave to give us life, to glorify God and to reach you, to save you. See, for Christians and for Christianity, the resurrection is the keystone to everything. It joins together Christmas with Good Friday and Easter and gives us direction for our life. Without the resurrection, without Easter, without an empty tomb, all of this collapses. The whole gospel collapses. That's why it's so important that we decide, what do we do with this? What am I going to do with this? Because without an empty grave, it's confusing, this whole Jesus thing. But with an empty grave, change can come. See, without an empty grave, all we have is just a dead Jew. That's all this is. If the grave's not empty, it's just another Jew who died, and that doesn't mean anything for us. Without an empty grave, we can't have deliverance from our sins. We can't be delivered from that. But with an empty grave, because of Easter, because of this day, Jesus crucified and Jesus risen through the empty grave. We have a doorway to heaven. That's the gospel that's being preached here in 1 Corinthians. And I pray, I hope it's the gospel being preached here at the gathering today. You have to know it since you're here. No pressure. But know this, the choice before you is one, not to how to accept Easter, how to accept the resurrection, but a choice of do I want hope or not? Do I place my hope in Jesus or not? Because the result of our choice is you can live, you can be without hope. I was for a long time. I have many loved ones who still are today. That's the result if we just say that grave's not empty. I don't get it. I'm not putting my, my mind or my trust there. You can live without hope. That's where you are. That's who you are. And all of us were there at one point. And then that choice was laid before us like it's being laid before you today. What do I do with this? What did Jesus do? Since you're here, since I'm dressed up, let me tell you real quick what he did. See, you are where you are, but Jesus did what he did for you. 
No matter where you're coming from, no matter where you're going, no matter what you've done or are doing, he did what he did for you. Look at the next couple of verses with me, starting in verse three. Paul says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. See, he's got a tactic here. He does it in the first couple of verses. He does it here. I've got this. I'm giving it to you. Now it's your choice to respond, to receive, to accept, to be aware of it or to avoid it. But Paul's like, this is what I got, so I've got to give it to you. So he says, I've received this, and now I pass it on to you. And what is he passing on? He says this, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried and that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the Twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time. Most of them are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all of the apostles. Paul says, let me remind you what Jesus did. Jesus did what he did, and he did it in accordance with the scriptures. Paul says it twice there. Did you notice that? I always tell our people here, if you see something repeated multiple times in a, in a close section of verses, take note. Paul is saying here that this is in accordance with the scriptures. What Jesus did is in accordance with the scriptures. He's saying that these aren't my words. They weren't Paul's words. They're not my words. This is in accordance with God's word. This was God's plan. So when it says here to us, in accordance with the scriptures, what it's saying is, is that Jesus' death and burial and resurrection, his appearance to over 500 people was in accordance with scripture. It's telling us it's in accordance with God's plan. This was God's plan all along. All of this was his plan. Because all of this was to fulfill his promise. And all of this was to do it through the purpose of Jesus coming and dying for us and then being resurrected from the grave three days later. All of this was in accordance with God's plan. Born, lived, sacrificed, died, resurrected. And Paul says that when he was resurrected, he appeared. He appeared to Cephas. That's Peter. That's his other name. He appeared to Peter and to the disciples. And he appeared to 500 people at one time. And he appeared to James and he appeared to the apostles. That doesn't include other people who we know from Scripture that saw Jesus after the grave, after the Easter, after the resurrection. There were women and children. There were fishermen. There were people that he walked with and talked with. Jesus didn't just die and was resurrected. He was resurrected and lived. He talked with them. He laughed with them. He taught them. He journeyed with them to lay before them and us the choice of what we do with the resurrection. Because all of these people he appeared to, be it Peter or the 500 or the apostles or James or you or me, he appears to us because we have no resurrection without him. We have no chance at life eternal, a resurrected life forever without him. No one can experience that. So he comes to show himself. And he showed himself to these people because they didn't just concoct a plan. They didn't just come up with a story. Paul's saying here that he showed himself to all these people because the reality of him coming forth out of the grave changed everything. Not just the prevailing thought, it changed everything. History, life, heart, spirit, soul for these people and for all of us here. Easter happened and Jesus showed that he was like no one else. Because up until this point, it was good thoughts and good ideas and good vibrations. But then he died, just like everybody dies, right? And he's gone, just like everybody's gone, or so they thought. Everybody does that except Jesus. He died, but it could not hold him. He lives now because he's resurrected. And what that meant for Paul and for the people in 1 Corinthians and all the people that Jesus appeared to and every single one of us here today is that what Jesus said was truth. What he did was to save. He died so he could give grace and he rose again so he could give life. Jesus showed them and I pray that Jesus is showing us here today, friends, is that he was with them and he is with them and he will always be with them. And the truth is, he can be for you as well. 
Because there's many people here today who haven't seen the physical resurrected Jesus, but they trust and hope in these stories. They trust and hope in these words. They trust and hope in God's plan and that it was for them and for their life. Why? Because they don't want to be without hope. They see that through the resurrection, they can be with Jesus. And so can you. You can be with Jesus. But the choice is yours. To receive it, to be aware of it, or to hear it in vain and to continue to avoid it. So that's why Paul lays out these facts. Here's what happened. And it was all for God's plan. Here's who saw it. And this is what they did with it. But the reality was for these people and for all of us is those are just facts. And facts don't give hope. We need to hear personal story of change. We need to hear personal stories of hope because only Jesus could give them that hope. Only Jesus offers that to Paul, to the readers here, and to the listeners in this room. And when Jesus does that, when he does give us hope, and you receive it in faith and trust, and you become aware of it, everything changes. It goes from us just simply being here to being in Jesus. And we can say, just like Paul's about to say, I am what I am. I am what I am. That's what Easter does. It takes us from just simply being here and hearing the facts of what Jesus did to saying, I am what I am in grace. I am what I am in Christ. Look at the last couple of verses and then I'll shut up and we can have lunch. In verse eight, it says this, last of all, as to one untimely born, Jesus appeared also to me. For I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preach so you can believe. Paul drops his story. He reminds them, the choice is theirs. He reminds them of the story of Jesus, the facts that are before them. But then he says, but let me make it real to you. Here is my journey. I'm the least of them, Paul says. I was a persecutor of the church. He hated Christians. He hated their story. He hated what they represented. He hated the resurrection. That the fact that it was even out there, he hated that. He was a murderer. He murdered Christians. He was well learned. He knew the scriptures, but he did not trust that there was a plan behind the scriptures. And so when it says in accordance with the scriptures, it was with God's plan. Then Jesus appeared to him. Paul was going off to arrest, persecute, murder more of the church, more of the Christians. And Jesus resurrected, appeared before him and everything changed for Paul. Because when we are presented with the resurrection, when we're presented with the truth of what Jesus did and why he did it, it stops us in our tracks and it changes everything. Paul made the choice to be aware of what it meant when it said in accordance with the scriptures. That meant God's plan, but it also meant grace. In accordance with scriptures means grace for Paul to say, I am what I am. And for Peter and for James and the 500 and the, the, the apostles, all of them are able to say, in grace, I am what I am. I've got a past. It's messed up, but I am what I am in grace. And guess what? Here's the miracle of Easter. So can you. It doesn't matter where you've been, what you've done, what you're going through right now, who you've hurt, who you've turned back on, who you've cheated on, who you've cheated. You can say, I am what I am in grace. Because when the resurrection comes before us and we make a choice to be aware of it and put our hope in it and to receive that grace that's before us, not only can we be with Jesus, we can now be with God. You can be with God. That connection that you've been missing is there before you and it's only possible because of Jesus and what he did on the cross and what he did in the grave. 
Everything has changed in grace. In grace, a sinless man was slain. In grace, a humble man was humiliated. In grace, a good man was given to death. In grace, a righteous man was resurrected. That's why Paul can say, I am what I am. That's why he can work harder to tell others, to make sure that they know. That's why in grace, he can move forward. And so can we, so can you. Just like Paul, we can say, I don't receive this in vain anymore. I am aware of it. I accept it. I put my hope and my trust in it. I am what I am. No matter where you've been, no matter where you are right now, you're here for a reason. You are here for a purpose, to hear what Jesus did and to respond to it and be able to say, today, tomorrow, forever, in grace, I am what I am. The choice is yours. It's laid before you. I miss those stories of being a youth pastor. Let me give you one more. I took a group of students to Pigeon Forge one time because that's what they tell you to do when you become a youth pastor. You want to be a youth pastor? Take the kids to Pigeon Forge. All right, I got it. In fact, that's all they taught me in seminary. They, they said, what do you want to be? I said, I want to be a youth pastor. They said, take them to Pigeon Forge. Then they gave me a degree. It's awesome. I'm still paying on it. So I did what I was taught. I took students to Pigeon Forge and I took them to a conference and every night we would gather together and have this worship service similar to the one that I had in California. Except the speakers were way better than I were. Not as well dressed, but way better than I were. In one of the last sessions, the main speaker who kind of organized this whole thing, he got up and he was a beautiful communicator and he clearly articulated where we were, what Jesus had done, and what our response can be to it. And then he did what a lot of these communicators do. They're like, everybody bow their heads and close their eyes. And I'm going to give you a chance in a second to respond to what Jesus has done. If you're aware of what he's done, to be able to respond to it. And all of a sudden I'm thinking, they didn't tell me about this in seminary. They just told me to take them to Pigeon Forge. Because I was sitting right in the middle of the theater. I was in the middle of my row. Smack dab. I didn't know that I was supposed to be on the end because he said, in a second, your youth leaders are going to meet you out in the lobby of the theater. And I'm like, wait, what? I'm in the middle. How am I going to get there? So I started doing something that they didn't tell me to do in seminary either. I started praying that none of my kids would move because I was stuck in the middle of the row. But because God loved my students more than I loved them, apparently, when he said, all right, now go. I know you've got questions. Go, meet with them in the lobby. They're going to be out there waiting for him. Like, I'm not waiting for him. I'm right here. And sure enough, at the end of my row, on the first seat of the row, where I should have been sitting was a kid named Tyler. And he jumped up like somebody had lit his chair on fire. And he starts hustling down the row. He's moving so quick that none of the stupid youth ministers like me were even out in the lobby yet. Because we didn't know. We just took him to Pigeon Forge. He is hustling up the road and I start to like shove people out of my way because I got to get to him. He's responding. He's aware of what Jesus said. I got to tell him about it. So I'm trying to push myself my way out there and he's busting it up to the lobby. He is all the way to the end of the road and I'm like yelling like, Tyler, Tyler, but music's playing, all this stuff's going on. He didn't hear me. That kid just kept moving. He was following the instructions. I am aware of Jesus. I need Jesus. I'm going to go until somebody tells me what I do next. And he took off through the doors. Finally, I get to the end. I run up the aisle going, Tyler, Tyler, Tyler. I burst through the doors. Tyler's moving so quick. No one's in the lobby but him. He is flying across the lobby, just walking until somebody gives him the answers, gives him what to do next. That's how intense his response was. I had to run across the lobby. I finally caught him. His hand was on the door leaving the theater. He was going into fresh air. That's how far he had gone. That's how willing he was to respond that he was going to go out. If I hadn't stopped him, he'd still be walking today. That's how intense his response was. He would have just kept on going to Gatlinburg and then North Carolina. He'd be somewhere on the Atlantic right now. But all he knew was, I am aware of what Jesus has done and I'm going to respond to it and I'm going to go until somebody helps me know what to do next. When we talked, he was so cognizant of what he needed to do. I need Jesus. His only question was, Joel, what do I do next? 
So I was able to look at him just like I am to you today and say, trust in what Jesus did on the cross. Trust in what Jesus did in the grave. Trust what he is doing in your life today because he is fulfilling God's plan for you so you can have purpose and live in God's promise that he's never forgotten you no matter where you've been or done or whatever you're going to do. The mistakes, the sins, the struggles, the pains, the guilt, the shame that you feel, he has made a way because Jesus lives and he can live inside of you. Yeah, that's strange. Yeah, it's wild, but that's what Easter is. It's a crazy God in crazy love reaching out to every single one of us. So the choice is yours. Stand in it, be aware of it, or continue to be in avoidance, living in vain, but the choice is yours. I pray, I hope, that with whatever faith you can muster, within the grace that God has for you, you can reach out and say, I need that. I don't know what all it means, but I need that. When we're done, I'm gonna pray and just say, I'm gonna loiter here in the shadows. But just know, I will chase you to the lobby if I need to. I will go to your car. We will ride to lunch together. You will buy me lunch. If I can tell you what Jesus has done for me, if I can tell you my resurrection story, that what the cross and the grave and the man who died on it and rose from it, what he did for me. Paul is gonna be right down the hall in front of the, the snack bar that never gets used in the movie theater. We don't even know why it's here. It's here so Paula can stand in front of it because she'd love to tell you about what Jesus did for her, for her family, for her husband who helped start this church. The people who brought you here would love to tell you their resurrection story to just help you understand that, yeah, the choice is yours, but there is before you the opportunity to choose hope or to continue to live without friends and love and grace. Choose hope because it's there for you today and every day because Jesus lives. Pray with me. Father, we thank you for this day. And man, I have muddled it up, but I pray that your spirit moves so powerfully that it draws us to respond to you in grace, for life, now and forever. And God, there are people here today who've avoided it for far too long. May this resurrection day be their resurrection day where their old life is no more and they have new life in Jesus only offered by him, solely offered to them so they can connect with him and with you and have eternity. Father, we thank you for the cross and we thank you that Jesus is no longer on it. The only thing on it is our sins. We thank you for the grave and we thank you that Jesus is no longer in it. All that's left now is a risen Savior who has changed so many lives, so many hearts, so many eternities in this room and he's standing ready to do it again. May we respond to you with hope and share that as we leave this place knowing that Easter is not just a day to dress up and be with your family and eat candy. Nothing wrong with those, but Easter is a day to respond, to react, to be aware of what Jesus did for every single person here. Thank you for them. And God, we thank you for him. And it's in his name, in Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Thank you all so much for being here with us today. We're honored that you would choose to spend this Easter, this Resurrection Day with us here. I'd love for you to come back anytime. We're here every Sunday at 9 and 10.30. We'd love for you to come back. And, and in fact, join us next week because next week we're going to start a brand new series walking out of Easter called Encore because it's not over. The story is not over on Easter. The story is just beginning. And we want to show you what Jesus left behind so we can live the resurrection so we can live that out and what that means. And we're going to study all month long the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, the third person of God to come and to give us life and to help us dwell in it and to move forward in it. It's going to be a great journey together. You're welcome to come back next Sunday or any Sunday. Until then, just remember, Jesus lives and he lives for you. You guys got it? Good. Get out of here. Have a great day. Bye.